My name's Jennifer Gilmore. I'm the author of three novels. The most recent one is called The Mothers, um, and the other two are called Golden Country and Something Red. I mean, my previous books are sort of, they take place over several generations. They're about what happens to a family over time um, and how history affects families. In a way, this book is very much about families. It's about a couple going through an adoption, an open adoption, which is what most of the um, adoptions are in this country, which means you have a relationship with the birth father, I mean, birth mother and often the birth father. So um, the story made most sense to me to um, talk about in the first person, which was very difficult for me to write about. I'm very interested in and like to write these big, broad social things that come from ideas. And so I had to convince myself that this was an important idea. Um, my husband and I were going through an open adoption um, that was very protracted and gave me me a lot of material. And I started thinking about it as a novelist. And um, her voice, the protagonist's voice, just started coming to me. And it was, I, I, I. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm thinking. So I had to overcome this idea that only big, big books are only in third person and, and really write this voice. Do, did you understand when you were getting into adoption what laid in front of you? Had anyone given you advice on, on the road that was in front? You know, it's a, that's a really interesting question because, of course, we talked to a lot of people. Adoption wasn't the first thing we pursued. We did a lot of, you know, IVF and all this sort of stuff. Um, I'd been, s I myself had been sick in my 20s, and so that was part of my issue. But um, no, I mean, everyone, everybody has a story of success because that's where they are, and then what's happened before fades. So it's not that everyone's telling you this happy story, but the agencies and the lawyers are all saying when you get a child, not if you get a child. There's a lot of coded language. Um, and you really don't know when you're going down this rabbit hole sort of wh what can happen and how really it can wreck you. Um, and most people I know who have adopted, and I know quite a few, have a story that's really painful and then they have the good story that's the story of them getting their child. So I, I always say, you know, every adoption story is a ghost story and I think that that's really true. When you were um, going through that process, how many years did it take? And, and, and talk a little bit about the sort of labyrinth that you entered into and twists um, and turns. The process took uh, several years, um, just from making your profiles and doing all this, you know, jumping through a lot of hoops, a lot of paperwork, you know, FBI fingerprint, you know, all stuff that needs to happen. But, you know, you had to write your address for everywhere you've lived since you were like three years old. Um, but once we really got into it, which um, you, I talked to the birth mothers directly, so they could call me at any time. Um, and the effect, what happened was, I was getting a lot of calls from birth mothers who would see our profile online, and it would be wrong to call them birth mothers because they turned out to not be pregnant, or they were interested in emotional support, or some of them were interested in financial support, and um, so we encountered just. You know, we weren't met with compassion, I'll put it that way. And that was really hard. And then the book deals, the mothers deals with that a lot. Um, in my personal life, things went completely more crazy than that. Um, and we were in a lot of, cra you know, really awful and tragic situations, not just for us, but for everyone. And, and that were so dramatic. Um, and we have a baby now who's three months old, and even the story of that is quite dramatic. So um, it's true, once you get the baby, the experiences start to fade. But um, I think everybody needs to know that adoption is not for the faint of heart. Being in the process of the adoption was like really the seventh ring of hell. I mean, you don't, there's not a yesterday and there's not a tomorrow. You're just in this moment, especially when it's this, you know, I hate to use this, the term roller, roller coaster, but you get contact, I would get contacted by a birth mother and her, her heart would sing. And then that birth mother would choose someone else and we would, you know, I would take to my bed. <laughs> you know, it was just this, and the phone could ring at any time. You're just like always on ready. But um, also, interestingly, what you encounter in other people is is interesting and somehow sometimes disarming and sometimes upsetting. Um, I don't know for anyone who's ever been ill, and I'm not comparing ado <laughs> the adoption process to an illness, but you're always uh, you can be surprised by how people react. So people have said the most atrocious and crazy stuff to me, um, both bef you know when I was going through an adoption with my husband and after. It's just shocking what people say. Like what? Um, I've had somebody come up to me at a reading and said, you know, I have a lot of friends who have adopted. You're really in for it. 
okay. Or, you know, people say something that they think is innocent, like, have you ever thought of a surrogate? No, I've been doing this for a decade and I haven't thought about a surrogate. Can you tell me what that's about? You know, it's just, and they're just trying to help. But then, and then at the same time, people you know, and your friends and your family, my friends and my family were having kids and they were moving on with their lives and we were just staying the same. And that was really hard and it wasn't necessarily my friends or family's fault. But, um, you know, they were doing things with their kids and we were just <laughs> the same. And um, we have, you know, I think very rich lives, but um, they weren't changing. And I think we need to change, you know, as people. For me, I mean, I think I said at the beginning, I'm so interested in families and what happens to families over time. And actually my protagonist talks about this too. And so what if, if I don't have the next generation, what happens to our stories? What happens to our families? And that really terrified me, not having that continuation. It wasn't a memoir, to your point. How did you go about sort of creating that separation from your world and the world of your character? Well, I think writing a novel in general, there's a certain narrative distance between you and the character. So this um, story, or what my husband and I were, in fact, going through, brought up all these issues that I think are very interesting social issues, you know. Choosing the race, like checking the, the blank, you know, choosing the drug use, uh, thinking about the socioeconomic situation of these people who ha are placing their babies, and just the way motherhood is sanctioned in our culture, so how badly this character wanted to be a mother and why. And of course, I, because we, it took us a really long time, I've had an exceptionally long time to think about what being a mother means. So, um, you know, some people who just get pregnant right away, it's not that they don't value it, it's just that they haven't done the psychic, <laughs> they haven't done this sort of psychic thinking that I could have done a lot less of. But um, I think that I approached it at first as I always approach novel writing, which is as an idea. And um, these characters, even though I heard Jesse's voice, the protagonist, um, it really wasn't me. It was more um, watching her do things. And it was, in fact, a relief from my life. And it made what we were going through sort of more interesting anthropologically. And I could focus on that. I don't know if you're a writer. I'm sorry. Um, as a writer, the more you um, accumulate pages, the more happy you are. So accumulating pages is actually helping me get through, <laughs> through the situation. Can you talk a little bit about how you decided to invoke humor in the book and why that was so important to it? Absolutely. Um, this issue of humor, I think, is a really important one. Um, you can say whatever you want as long as you're funny. So if I'm talking about literally a couple choosing to not take an African-American child, which is atrocious to this protagonist, you ha I mean, it's so outrageous what, how people's minds work. And I just wanted to make, and you know, she has a funny voice. She's a bit glib. She's been in a bad mood for like five years. And um, it's important. I mean, also, you know, Jewish humor, it goes back a long way. You know, the Jews survived through humor. And I think there is something in that, both as a writer that I have more freedom when I'm funny. Also, I mean, I'm not into total solemnity. And also just um, it, it lets her survive as a, as a protagonist, too, to just see the world in a funny way too, not only tragic.